All right. So we're joined today by Heidi and Hari of Rizeri Sinister, among many other bands. So Heidi, you want to introduce yourself? Just give us some background on your musical background. Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Heidi. And uh, I have a, like uh, been involved in several bands and uh, Horse Latitudes, for example, the first like actual like I ever recorded band I was in the Black Doom kind of stuff. Then uh, Ride for Revenge, I play bass. And uh, then I have this dead black metal band Deep Raymond, which I play bass and do some vocals. And then Regular Sinister, which is kind of my this personal kind of own thing, which which I do with the Harry. Mm -hmm. And you want to can now tell himself yeah. about your musical like app approach. And you, you have a new album coming out. Um and yes. I'm going to release it. You want to talk about that for a minute? Well, uh our album is a kind of a it has been under work for like a longer while. We started like a recording first tracks for it like a 2021. Was it, yeah, something like that, yeah. And uh, we finalized it actually just like uh, about last month when we got this final like uh, needed guest vocal part done. And uh, now it's like uh, currently it's going on this mastering process and uh, it's it's like uh, completed. So that's yeah. the, like it has been a kind of a couple of years process to get it finalized, but it has been like um, mostly done for a good while ago. <laughs> but now we finally get it on that like a final, you know, phase. Yeah. 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 In my opinion, it's probably the strongest material yet. And thank you. For those of you who don't know the style of music, uh, you want to just describe what it sort of sounds like. Yeah, well, it's a bit like a, it's a mixture of uh, of our strongest influences from uh, like uh, old Greek and old like uh, Brazilian, like uh, this early '90s black doom kind of things. Like uh, if you want to me to mention some bands which has been influenced, for example, myself a lot as a musical way of course like uh if we've mentioned first this finish like uh beherit <laughs> beherit is uh, like uh, it's both of me and mine and harris like uh, this uh, most uh maybe long-term influence and also like those uh old greek stuff like uh old rotting christ old necromantia baratron lemegeton totir this kind of shit mm -hmm. and then there mm -hmm. comes like uh from Brazil, those old Barbacena bands like uh, Invoker, Azaradel, mm -hmm. Behemoth, mm -hmm. yeah, this kind of stuff. And then some old European bands like Santatol, like there's a lot of big spectrum of like a different kind of influences, but maybe those are the Samael, yeah, old Samael, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah I definitely hear uh... Like old Necromantia with the bass driven stuff. Um, and of course, Beherit is there. That's kind of a national treasure of Finland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's probably the most famous uh, metal band or um, at least underground metal band at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's not exactly like the style of when, when you describe it as, as a Black Doom. Most younger people will just think of like, I don't even know what Black Doom is at this point, but definitely not what you guys are playing. You know, the, the bands that you mentioned are so archaic and so obscure to the to the younger generation. They might know Rotting Christ or something or, you know, Iberathron, Beherit, but, you know, the Brazilian early 90s scene is completely still unknown, you know, and we we just published this thing with Zombie Dance exactly yeah Which i hope will help to spread the early 90s uh brazilian sound because they were doing something completely different around that time yes. too before everything got kind of homogenized and 
kind of boring by the by 93 or something i feel like brazil sort of fizzled out they had their peak in 96 or i mean 80, 86 mm. 87 somewhere around there with the kagamawa bands and then it peaked again in the very early 90s with all those all those bands coming in like murder rape and mystifier and yeah exactly and even impurity and then it sort of fizzled out um but yeah it's interesting that you cite those bands specifically because they're so obscure well it's a kind of for myself i have always had this like uh will to like uh, you know dig deeper on the like a uh, deeper through that like a uh, so-called like uh, this uh, mainstream core like uh i mostly listen old bands myself <laughs> like my favorites are mostly like this ones coming from early 90s late 80s kind of you know this period of time because mm -hmm. um and where i listen bands pretty much like internationally like i don't i don't like uh, only focus on some certain like a country but i need to say that the countries like Greece and Brazil, for example, which are absolutely one of the most biggest influences, probably from a uh, regular sinister music and uh, like a wide spectrum. Those were having so like a so like an original kind of sound mm -hmm. on their mm -hmm. like a doings that it it was something which left big impression for myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. for also like it affects for the music, which I, I have been always wanting to do. And uh, I love the like those old Brazilian black doom bands, which were kind of also, which we mentioned earlier, they were like a kind of a, done in a pretty small group of people, you know, mm -hmm. and they were like a, playing in each other's bands and like a, progressing that way forward. And uh, developing the their own kind of underground, on underground kind right. of uh, right. you know, the scene there. Yeah, and... right. I think the there's a recurring theme in my conversations with people who really dig deep, and it's yeah. it's, this, it's this idea of regional sound. Yes. Discover and how globalization and the internet pretty much destroy that concept. It's it's a it's kind of sad to me because you don't get that anywhere anymore, right? Like yeah, well, I need to say actually, uh, in Finland at least, like what I have been like you know noticing mm -hmm. around like uh, I know uh, like a lot of this local bands which are like uh, having their completely own scenes, for example, who live in a uh, different parts of Finland, different cities, even mm -hmm. different like uh, you know places in a different cities have their own like a, you know small scene going on mm -hmm. and i think that's actually a very interesting and very nice thing to notice among like a younger people also okay. and uh, uh, around like a different kind of uh, metal scenes for example like uh, there is a different young group of young people doing their own thing in a uh, for example death metal part mm -hmm. and then there is a different group of young people doing their own black metal stuff and those are kind of uh, different groups which work also together and arrange gigs and you know mm -hmm. this kind of stuff do some like uh, split tapes or something and I think that's actually very interesting and good thing to notice that there actually still finds people who want to do that mm -hmm. kind of stuff but of course it's a uh, nowadays it's a uh, different than it was like a years back, like a decade ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think the insulation factor is no longer there because of yes. everything Absolutely. is available. So anything can get across the border, anything can come in very yeah. quickly. I think this this like free flow of information is good on one hand, like this conversation we're having is done through the internet. Yeah. But at the same time, I think for regional sound, you have to have this um uh, insulated scene um and that i mean i don't think it's possible to go back it's a time and place thing and i think it was killed by the internet and also just the general ease of getting tapes and whatever in the 90s so i think by like 95 or so i think regional sound was pretty much all gone you know 
Like the Greeks had sort of abandoned ship. The last rotting Christ that sounded like rotting Christ was probably Triarchy of the Lost Lover. Triarchy, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I can like I can still say I like that one, but anything after that, it's like ah, it doesn't even sound like rotting Christ to me. Yeah. Um, I think Verathron is still doing something that sounds like Verathron, but I feel mm -hmm. like they're looking back to their old catalog and like checking to see how they were writing songs in the past. I get that feeling when I listen to their new songs. It's still good, uh, but I don't hear the spark of, um, I don't know, originality or whatever it is that, you know, that was really burning in the early 90s and late 80s. Yeah. I, I need to say I agree mostly of that, <laughs> everything, because I'm kind of a person who... I still like, uh, you know, I, I used to do tape trading, for example, and I used to like uh, find a lot of like uh, those bands which have been influencing my own like uh, mindset and my own like uh, this uh, vision about music and what I want to do through like uh, trading tapes, for example, and uh, reading like uh, signs and stuff like that. And I still do that because... I I try to like keep up with that kind of underground that doesn't exist almost anymore because mm -hmm. it just like a, you need to nowadays you need to find some people who actually do that thing and it's not easy always you know it's right. just like a good good luck if you like find some like a cool underground scene from some like a place and then you do like make that contact and you try to like keep it up because it's a this dying, you know, th dying like a way to do things. Yeah. But I think uh, like uh, it has been a big, big impact for myself also, like uh, to like uh, how to learn to do things that way instead of just doing everything, like uh, putting everything on the internet instantly and trying to like uh, get like a listeners that way. It's a uh, I have been always wanting to do things a bit different way it's just like it feels more natural for myself yeah, yeah. I mean, you being a graphic artist as well probably i think we there is a concept that we should discuss you know digital versus analog you know yeah. virtual reality world versus real world i yeah. think that's something we need to explore in this conversation because you do visual art as well but before yeah. we get there let me um let me let uh hari talk a bit and introduce of course, yeah um so hari you want to just give give us your musical background and the bands that you play in? Well, yeah, <clears throat> my musical background um, originally it's it starts somewhere completely different than metal metal music. I used to when I was a young young younger like a teenager. My first real band was actually like progressive psychedelic rock stuff. Mm -hmm. Like lots of not not like a virtuoso style of playing, but more like this uh, sort of a primitive, but still like psychedelic and progressive performative music. But then, uh, like um, when I was like eighteen, say that seventeen, eighteen, I uh, I heavily went into the punk and hardcore punk, especially, mm -hmm. and that was my that was my gateway metal eventually like when i was like uh uh near getting nearer to 20s mm -hmm. I, I kind of kind of started to listen to metal at the first time i used to i used to listen to like a uh, old heavy metal stuff because of my dad's dad's record collection when i was like a like a small child but for me i, I didn't have the the metal teenage years you know mm -hmm. i was just like and i went went lots into the hardcore punk especially finnish Mm. Finish hardcore punk um, when I was like twenties and stuff like that, and after that started to listen to some thrash, death metal, and it was like I, I think I was like twenty three or something when I when I well, kind, of, kind of discovered the black metal thing. I remember it from my youth, mm -hmm. like I remember the the, the black metal teenagers at for, at my hometown, but I I. I was so distant from the whole scene back then uh, or, or the, the mentality and stuff like that. But yeah, but ever since, like, I think 
like finding that kind of music in adult adulthood it it kind of uh, i think it's probably quite different to many other people but it's yeah. still like i think since that the like the black metal has been like growing more and more important to me and I, I, for the last decade or something it's been my i think my uh, main sort of channel or inspirational like i i think that's i kind of kind of when i when i found it found it i i i kind of realized that the whole idea that black metal wasn't just like a, a genre of heavy metal you know it right. it was more like more like a art form of itself and that was the revelation i i sort of i finding like you know drawing down the moon and like Bursum's mm -hmm. greatest albums, those kind of clicked into me, and I, I realized that this is is isn't just like metal, played like more, something something like more artistically more in, in uh, interesting as well. Right. So, yeah. But now, yeah, nowadays, I still still play. I've been playing like punk bands, hardcore punk bands. I still play some hardcore punk bands and even some crust stuff nowadays but like yeah I, I think my main main bands are like my solo solo band hail conjurer and mm. also right for revenge which has been i've been part of like a, a decade now and um yeah, yeah. I, I think those yeah I, I also sing in hooded menace and that kind of stuff so doing, oh, i didn't know that you were in hooded menace too yeah yeah, I, I, yeah i've been singer from uh, 2016 okay yeah, yeah you, your origin story is very interesting because you started out frog and psych and most young people don't really do that if that's you kind of you did it in the reverse because most bands or you know most people musicians go in that direction later in life like enslaved is now kind of going more in the you know frog and psych kind of direction with enslaved and they started out playing more raw black metal and then you know, they slowly they transition over to that style, but you started out with that kind of old people music, and then you went to yeah. black metal or punk and hardcore, which is young people music, and then to black metal, which is a little bit older people music, I think, or I don't know how it is in the, in Europe, but at least in the U.S., I think black metal isn't something that younger people are so much into. Um, it seems like Punk, hardcore, and death metal is very popular among uh, younger people. When I say younger, anyone from teenagers all the way up to 25 or something, something like that. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, yeah. When I was a teenager, like my prog and psychedelic rock years, I was like only listening to the, the music that was done in the 60s and 70s. I, the 80s was all, also already a little bit too modern for me, so I was really like you said, like the old people's music, but I, I think the doors, the doors was my do gateway, the door, hmm. the music in general, like the whole idea of appreciating album formats and like, act, hmm. like really creative stuff. But I think, yeah, soon after that came like Velvet Underground and all that stuff, like be more primitive. And I think it's still like, a, because it's to be the progressing progression has been like this way. I don't have to do you know, uh, like trying to find progressive ways to do stuff. Like like on top of the the things I do, I I think mostly there are some methodological ways, improvisational ways that I still I think I kind of grew into that are still there, but it's. Uh, I, I think it's more like a regressive, <laughs> so more regression in 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 in, my, in the whole idea of like trying to get more into the primitive ways of creating music instead of like too progressive or or too I don't know professional ways, more like a, into the primitive underground mm -hmm. style. Yeah. Um... Sammy from Ride for Revenge was also doing cross punk type stuff, right? Before uh, Ride for Revenge and even before Incriminated. I, I remember he did 
irritated or something. Um, I had yeah. by them a long time ago. Yeah, it was like a grind core. Oh, like a, grindcore. yeah, it was a grind. Yeah, irritated was grind core, but he was also doing. He was singing Catastrophe Alue, which is a. Uh, we we are originally from like a, the towns next to each other. I didn't. Sami is like ten years older than me, so I wasn't. I, I didn't know him when I was young, but mm -hmm. I got to know him like in my twenties because I yeah we played at the same punk gigs and all that stuff mm -hmm. when he was still doing irritate and um, but yeah catastrophe Alloy was one of actually one of my my favorite nineties hardcore bands he mm -hmm. sang there were a couple of other there were other singers as well in in the band but his his uh, records from that area they are still like classic in my books mm. really really nasty really harsh mm. like yeah check it out i i grew up listening to punk hardcore when i was a young teenager but i sort of just switched over all of a sudden to metal in in high school so i didn't really pay attention to too much hardcore so much in the 90s i i did listen to some like some stuff that came out in the u.s like born against and citizens arrest that was very early 90s, but then I stopped and just switched completely over. So I got to check out some of the Finnish stuff because uh, I've always liked Finnish hardcore. Like, yeah. especially the 80s stuff, of course. Yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link you a couple of my favorites from the 90s from the same era, like okay. Catastrophe Alue and Kiros. I, I'm going to send you some links over. Like, yeah, after, yeah. After let them. me check it out. I'll stick it in the... I'll stick it in the description for this podcast so people can listen. Yeah, yeah. and I need I need to mention here, like I, I'm kind of this <laughs> this kind of person that I have never liked punk. <laughs> yeah, when I was like a you know, like at thirty years old or something, I started to like a, listen death metal, and I had that like a period when I only listened like some old death metal bands and stuff, and I had my like this school like a death metal project which we tried to like make but it didn't never succeeded very well but it was like um then i later i kind of came up for like some of this older punk bands which harley for example showed me and i i still like some of them but for me personally metal has been always the only thing i <laughs> kind of listen mm. in addition to like some old rock music but yeah did you two listen to any old industrial or noise or anything like that? Oh, uh, God bless and this kind of stuff I like a lot. Yeah, those okay. are those are still like I I need to say I like them. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I I've, I've uh, actually been getting like in a touristy way into noise stuff the last decade or something. I think it's probably mostly because of the of the collaborations like done with the other bands like when right for revenge did the bizarre uproar live collaborations and stuff so and i i i know some like noise artists as well the other ones as well so it's kind of um like uh it interested me you know uh in a way of mixing noise and industrial stuff with the other you know other musical styles more mostly uh the reason recent years but like now i've been i've been like starting to scratch a little the surface on the on the the actual noise stuff as well but i i like i said i'm more like a touristy kind of a person like my knowledge of the of the because i i, I realize how vast is the whole whole scene and the, the discographies are so so like huge so i i I've been listening to some stuff here and there, and and uh, like growing more and more interest in the in that kind of um, uh, expression. Uh, but yeah, it's it's yeah. I, I think you can also like like when you listen to the recent Hail Conjure stuff, you can you can actually like find the the references here and there. But it's like I don't I don't I don't say that I actually know. A lot of them that I I got some like some cuts here and there and like I I'm pretty curious about the nowadays scene actually because uh, there are lots of like for example in Finland there are lots of both the veterans but also the newer ones newer artists are doing pretty pretty interesting noise and industrial stuff right, right now so it's kind of inspirational for myself as well. 
Yeah. yeah, and also I need to say about that noise and uh, electronic stuff, mostly like uh, it's personally myself, it's a biggest, for example, right for events, we have a, like a um, lot of oscillators and this kind of, you know, elements used there. And uh, we actually did a split record with the regular sinister. We did the, the our US friend, uh, Reptile Wound, and uh, they are doing actually that very noisy kind of black metal. and. Through like those friends, we have been like uh, getting more of this nowadays. Bands also like uh, contacts with them, yeah. yeah. And also yeah. like uh, on that actual that uh, split we did with the reptile womb, there was also like a Sami was doing some noise elements on that record for a re regular sinister side also, yeah. Yeah, I think with almost any subgenre. For me, at least, I'm also a tourist when it comes to noise and industrial, but yeah. I just approach every subgenre as if the earliest material is usually the best because people are coming up with it without any sort of, you know, predetermined reference point. So I always go back to the earliest. And for me, like I, I never really grew up listening to stuff like that. But in college, my friends, uh, my friend Jason would tape me stuff like Throbbing Gristle. So I think like the first annual report is one of the most important things in that scene. I've been going back and listening to it kind of religiously lately, just because of some discussions I had with some noise musicians and, yeah. and I'm finding it a lot more meaningful now at age 48 than it did when I was 20, 21 or something when I, yeah. first heard it. so maybe it's uh it's another progression and the, uh, you know, musical listening maturity, People start out angry listening to punk, not Hari because he started out old, but <laughs> for me and most young people, um, not that I, so I think most people when they're young, they're angst written and they're listening to punk rock and hardcore and then they kind of mellow out and they find, they, they start looking for something a little bit less angry and more meaningful um so they go to like death metal or some other form of metal and then later on they find heavy metal to be more interesting because it's a little bit more nuanced and it's it's it's, it's like expressive in a different way right like when i listen to sarcophagus envoy of death there's so many layers to their recording yeah. and it's a little bit of prog a little bit of heavy metal uh and the songs are very well written so like nowadays I think I find myself listening to Beherit and then switching over to Sarcophagus and still getting the same kind of vibe from both. Um, I guess that's my long-winded way of saying that there is a musical maturity that people go through and maybe at some point you will get into punk rock and hardcore. <laughs> never. <laughs> I will never. You know, I need to say I'm kind of, a, you know, like a, I'm probably still staying on that like a teenage level that I only listen like a uh, that certain kind of uh, something but doesn't like a uh, punk just doesn't have you know anything that actually speaks to me mm. I rather mm. like listen to those old Brazilian bands like a sarcophago and this kind of stuff which has been like a old sepultura for example they have been getting a lot of influence of old like a for example Finnish hardcore yeah. But I need to filter that like a punk stuff through that like a trash or like a death metal or black metal stuff to like get those same vibes for myself to like a, it's just like a we we kind of that's the bit maybe the bif biggest difference with me and Harley about our musical influences that he likes a lot of like old punk stuff and then I'm more like at this puritan what comes to like that i i just listen old death metal and black metal and doom metal and this kind of shit but yeah i understand what you mean <laughs> yeah yeah, I'm the same. yeah I, I think the same difference goes with the like say um old like rock old rock like goth rock yeah. and all that stuff that's like more my my kind of thing than yeah. it is I mean, about about the about the progression of and, and I was just starting to think about the noise stuff. I think for me it's a uh, it has something to do uh, with um, the fact that I'm I've been like doing music myself because I I think I I kind of started to get more interested you know about the whole thing 
because of the like the textural mm -hmm. levels about it and so it's kind of a the ways of expressing like also in the texture ways of things and I, I i think it's kind of a at the same time it's reminding me from the from the this improvisational or psychedelic stuff when it was like when we, i was like religiously listening to like pink floyd 66 live like sid barrett like live improvisational stuff and i, I kind of a, like making noise not notes or even like a riffs or anything, but more like uh, sounds out of the mm. out of things. So I think it's a uh, the black metal has been my my way to find myself into the the noise because it's kind of a of the like finding out how it's how it could be like done within the black metal context mm. and then like developing an interest in the into the the actual thing and like appreciating the the creativity you can get from like non-rhythmic and non-melodical mm -hmm. ways more of like, a textual thing yeah yeah sounds and like like concrete like feel feel of the things and i like yeah i think that's a, that's a, my way of getting there like real like re, like i like i said i realized how I realized that black metal as a as an art form instead of mm. just a sound of heavy metal, it's kind of a realizing again like things I knew existed before, but realizing in a different context, realizing what what I think is the essence for me. I don't say it's the essence for everyone, but for me, it was the essential in the whole thing. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting um, journey because. I've been hanging out with Philip Best from White White House. You know, White House is one of the originators of noise and power electronics from the UK. He lives in Austin, so we meet up once in a while and have dinner and stuff. And he's gotten into black metal um, through the lens of noise, right? So it's like the total opposite. He was doing this for, you know, decades and decades, and then he got into black metal and now he's addicted. He comes over here and buys, you know, really raw black metal noise, noisy records. And there's some connection there. Um, I haven't really talked to him about it, but I should ask him, you know, what is it that black metal, you know, speaks to you as a noise musician? Same thing with the, uh, I haven't spoken to him, but I'll see him in Japan. Masona from Japan, he's one of the originators of Japanese noise from Osaka. He's now into black metal as well. So he goes he goes to Revenge Records and buys black metal apparently. So it's, yeah. it's very interesting that there's this reverse kind of evolution of noise musicians getting into black metal. Um, I interviewed Ryan Forster a couple of days ago and we were talking about how Sam McKinley from the Rita they're a Vancouver-based noise project. Um, he's also into noisy black metal, but more on the, you know, bestial black metal side, like Revenge and Conqueror and Gold Penis and stuff like that. Um, so he finds he finds that to be almost, uh, I guess. I mean, I don't want to speak on his behalf, but I'm guessing that he finds some sort of kinship for it with that kind of wall of noise black metal, um, because what he does is pretty much wall of noise as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's um the link is also there's uh the the uh, the black metal is also lots of about like um at, at least the black metal I I love is it's uh, also like has a lot the the sound itself has a lot of meanings like for yeah. example like like uh, the mentioned Pursum's philosophy for yes. example yes. like the, the whole texture whole, the whole sound is it's so unconventional for the the heavy metal kind mm. of way. It's, it's not like metal, like I said. It's it doesn't sound like metal music at all. But it's more like the the whole distortion. It just grows to be something else, and you you can get, get like almost hypnotized by the the pure sound of it. Right. And of course, the, the songwriting is brilliant as well. But the but I I can see the the idea of people like making some white noise stuff, and then Real, finding that kind of music where the the same kind of the noise might might be essential part of the whole sound of the band. So 
I, I think it's really logical connection between those two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that um, repetitive yeah. nature of stuff like Iljarn and and Burzum, yeah. yeah, definitely has connections to that kind of noisy, noisy. Yeah, sound. noisy, and also if if mentioning of noise, but I I need to say I maybe more myself have been like um like a trying to find out more of those like also dark ambient black ambient kind of bands though they're they're fun the artists which i like actually a lot mm. and um, mm. it's a like a noise and this uh, more like a dark black ambient things they are both some way more connected than straight like a black metal and noise for example mm. and it that's mm. the way how i have been also finding more like a, also those noise noise industrial kind of artists to listen yeah. yeah i think the early norwegian guys were really into tangerine dream i know euronymous was really into tangerine dream yeah. and that makes a lot of sense yes yeah. absolutely yeah i mean that's not so much dark ambient but more just keyboard music but exactly but still a bit of the same you know like a right play. yeah yeah um I want to switch gears a little bit and go back to this thing about visual art, analog art, you know, and versus digital and AI stuff that's happening now. This is a question that I ask a lot of artists because I think it's, you know, I, I get the feeling that we're on the same page, but it's worth discussing. And I, I like to hear your thoughts on where you stand on that. So let's start out with just visual art. You know, you're a visual artist. You did the cover artwork for Gary Sinister's album cover, among many others. I mean, you've done covers for stuff that I've done. Um, split with Cemetery Lights, that was you. Uh, uh, witchcraft split with um, ASCII. That was you as well, right? Uh, no, I haven't done cover art for witchcraft oh, split. Okay. That was a goat prayer who is my oh, okay. one of my yeah, closest was, friend. He's the witchcraft member. bass player. Yeah, but I have been doing uh, this. Um, if I think like uh, once, which has been released by Nuclear War. Now there has been this Antichrist. Um, oh right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then, like, um, I'm not sure, Human uh, Human Agony, which is a U.S. band, but I think it, it, it wasn't Nuclear War now. Who, no, that, uh, was, that was Final Agony and um, Invictus. Yeah, but for example, them, and then I have been, I have been doing some, like, uh, smaller artworks for Witchcraft, for example, mm -hmm. but uh, not actual album cover. Those are done by Code Prayer, but... Then right for revenge, I have been doing a lot of like album cover arts and uh, designs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like I like your style because it's pretty much just a hundred percent analog, including yes. the blackening, and that that's something that many artists don't do. And I I really hate it when they draw line artwork, but then they scan it into Photoshop or whatever, and then they do the trace. And the trace yeah. almost ruins the, the piece for me. Whenever they do any sort of touch-ups in Photoshop, mm -hmm. and I love Chris Moyen, but he started kind of merging the two, and it bugs the fuck out of me whenever he does that. Because, mm -hmm. like, you're such a good artist for this kind of stuff. Why can't you just do it the old way of just using a marker and coloring the background? Yeah. And I like that you do that, because it looks a lot more natural and in the... It looks a lot better when you do that. Thank you. I think the feedback very like uh, I appreciate it a lot because uh, I need to say I'm maybe the most like a uh, poorest artist ever. <laughs> like I literally use like I have a uh, three markers which I do use with uh, like this actual pencil and I I just draw like a uh, pure paper and like a. Uh, with the marker, you know, that's all. Then I then I go and scan it on the library <laughs> because it's free. I just have even scanner at home or anything. And uh, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> that's my way to do things. I just don't like to do them too, you know, difficult way. Mm -hmm. It's, um, of course, like um, when uh, doing like a, some album cover art for artists, uh, I rather like I made it by hand as 
long as possible then it needs to be scanned and then of course you can add just some like a bit of more contrast or something but actual artwork i only do that like a very simple way and that's how i like it to be done and uh, i haven't honestly even followed that automatic automatic intelligence you know like ai generated art stuff mm -hmm. but I have been getting that impression that it's kind of taking more and more like a place in the music industry and like a cover art scene, like uh, people use more and more of those kind of things, which are like a uh, factored more of this AI way. But yeah, I mean, even before this AI wave hit us, people are doing like, uh, you know, Photoshop collage. I call yes. them digital diarrhea because it always looks like shit yeah know, like the the children the bodum covers or whatever i mean music is shit too but the covers are even worse on those albums or like, i didn't say i like first children of bodum album <laughs> yeah yeah I I think think that that <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know what i mean those covers are atrocious i know like some it's... grim reaper guy and it's like yeah. and stretched and like Multiple yeah yeah stuff. in a way you know that 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 primitive photoshop stuff is becoming a little bit more um charming to me because you can still tell that some idiot human did it exactly. whereas with the new ai artwork i don't even want to call it art it's shit it's not yeah. art it's done yeah. by a machine it's it's not art yeah it's images ai generated images i I find those to be getting almost too good. And that scares me because yeah. at some point, maybe it will be able to mimic Chris Moyen's style or something and just like generate. Yeah. There's so much data out there for machine learning software to just start grabbing. So yeah, there might come a point where humans can't decipher the difference between the real thing and the, and the fake AI generated image. Yeah. And what does that mean? You know, that to me, that seems like spiritual death because uh, the, 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 the whole process of creation and putting yourself out there is basically like the meaning of life, right? Exactly. Um, I'm not an artist, but I put out records and that's my way of creating stuff in the real world. You as a graphic artist and a uh, musician, it must hit kind of close to home, right? That machines are coming yeah. in and kind of doing your job. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's a, it's just like a, I share completely your opinion about that. It scares kind of me how this world is like a, going to, you know, form. Because uh, nowadays, me, also in the music industry, if you think like a bands and stuff, there has been using more, more and more basically on that like a more you know, mainstream level of music. They, there is so much use of that, like a computer technology and this kind of stuff in a, like making sounds like a, in a certain way, mm -hmm. which are impossible to make if you just analog way record something on a studio with the actual played instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, same way in art, art world, like a, how it just starts to be more and more like a, you don't need to actually make any art. You just like a push the button and it, it does everything for yourself. And you can't ever anymore tell if it's actually drawn by someone or if it's just like a created by some pixels in a computer or stuff like that. And that's scary. I need to say, I, I don't like that development or progress or how, how the, you know, people usually want to that call. I don't like it at all. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like it's actually a uh, de-evolution in a way because we're evolving past humans and what it means to be humans. We're going back to the monkey state where we're not yeah. conscious anymore. We're exactly. just becoming like this mindless meat puppets that are com controlled by computers. Yeah, yeah, and that's scary because it's just like a the whole world is kind of getting more and more on that like a way that everything needs to be so easy that you don't need, need to do anything you know it's a it's a, like that's what humans aren't not supposed to be 
like we are supposed to use our own brain and own like a skills to create things, not like a just hanging there, like waiting some robot to give us commands or something. That's just like a, it starts to remind me about some religion, like, you know, people's just walking around, staring there like, a, like this um, phones and stuff like that. It's just like a, yeah, that just pieces off. <laughs> everything that's actual that has uh, spirit and like a uh, creative power and mm -hmm. yeah i think that concept of everything becoming easy and moving away from any sort of hard tasks yeah it's something that we should definitely explore a bit more on um and i'm gonna i'm gonna turn the table here to hari because i know that he works out and lifts weights and yeah. i feel like that's in a way creating barriers and making, I mean, working out and, and lifting weights is definitely one of these things that most people try to avoid. You know, they, just, they say yeah. they're healthy, but they don't do the working out part, which is essential yeah. for human health. Exactly. Um, I discovered that the hard way in my forties, you know? So mm. Hari, you know, when, when did you, you know, consciously, decide to include you know lifting weights into your routine uh i, I must uh, before i go there i must add that haiti haiti is as fanatic gym goer <laughs> as i do i am okay. but uh, i i was um i was uh I, it was like around when i was like 18 years old i used to be like when i was uh this it is my psychedelic rock era. I was really anti-sport. I, I found, find, found it very, like, unintelligent or, like, I, I kind of a, the sports in my mind because I was in a small town of 10,000 people and there were a lot of these ice hockey players and and these uh, cap-headed hillbillies mm -hmm. over there. It, it kind of, a, they were went together, but it, it was... Um, uh, I was um, with my high school friend, the guy who actually introduced me to the punk, the whole punk stuff. Uh, we were watching these martial arts movies and especially Shinya Tsukamoto's Tokyo Fist, mm. which was like our inspirational number one when we were like eight, 17, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to like, kind of a, got the idea of like physicality, not as a way of team sport, like having some like tribal like hanging around thing but more like a self-development thing mm -hmm. and it was at the same time i found my my father's like he used to work out when he was young i i like i wasn't close to my father anyway but i found his bodybuilding magazines and stuff so i kind of uh, i started to develop interest in martial art thing and the whole like the philosophical part of it mm -hmm. and also at the same time i like started started to find the bodybuilding as a like individual way of like uh, not not I, I started to work out at, at that time i i never got any any further with the martial arts because of the small towns uh <laughs> some little cap, like possibilities of having any courses or anything like that mm -hmm. i i just kept on watching movies and stuff but i i was like yeah i was 18 19 years old when i like even like considered for a while like maybe i should like really like do the natural bodybuilding stuff because it was just a, a new new this um which is coming to finland the competition thing of natural bodybuilding it wasn't the thing before that but it was like a new thing back then but um during the years when I went to the university and stuff, I, I it it got like several years without like actual like really good routines. But I, I kept on doing like this my own like body weight stuff and also some like I was doing lots of um going into the woods at that time and bicycling and all that kind of stuff. But I it was when I was near getting closer to the 30, like 10 years ago. Uh, 30 years old uh, then I kind of re like re refound the whole thing and wanted to like get more into the 
more bodybuilding way of doing things. Still not, still very amateur way of doing because of, uh, mm. I think it would require so much time and energy and art is still my main thing to do. But I, I, I really agree with the idea of having that sort of thing uh, with me we could we could uh, we might not might not go uh, like all the way to the philosophical level of it I, I i think we should i think it's very interesting and i, I think many listeners will find it more yeah, interesting I, than just describing what you guys play uh musically but there there's definitely a spiritual aspect to you know yeah for, for me it's, it's, it's a yeah, for me, it's not even spiritual because the the, the philosophical state, the stance I'm, I'm at, I I don't like believe in the spirit like in the first place. I mm -hmm. I, I like my, my metaphysical idea of everything is just flesh, mm -hmm. but it's and it's that that is my way kind of a music is is one uh, like major manifestation of that flesh thing for me. Uh, but I, I I see the whole like exercise, bodily exercises. I think they're all the same. But but in the everyday life, I think the mo major importance for me about the whole working out thing is to kind of um, like you said, like reminding me myself of the of the physical reality and and the the limitations and mm -hmm. kind of overcoming that. Uh, also, like not humbling down in a in a you no know, you know like a Christian way, like being humble or anything like that, but but still like a realizing realizing the the limitations I have and still like have something to like get over with like and like uh, break 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 those limitations at least a little in everyday life, like reminding me that there's still <laughs> stuff to do and not like just going into the easy place what what Heidi was describing earlier like yeah. just waiting for for I feel like Finland as a culture has a lot of this um you guys have the sauna which you know feels good for a little bit but after a while it becomes uncomfortable and you also have the tradition of jumping into you know cold lakes basically frozen lakes and just introducing these kind of micro hardships into your life um, seems to be a tradition of Finland. Is that a fair assumption or fair reading of Finnish culture? Well, I, I can say it's pretty, it's pretty like a well said, but also it's not only like this Finnish culture. It's like a if thinking like a musical way, for example, regular sinister as a band. Uh, it's uh, because my whole life is kind of that balancing on this like a uh, level of like this everyday uncomfortable beings. I have this like a uh, <clears throat> I have been needing to tolerate, for example, I have this autoimmune disease and stuff like that. And through like a uh, exercise and stuff, it's my like a way to kind of set myself free for this like a certain pain which I tolerate every day. It's uh, like a same way that I act towards music. It's a kind of uh, something, some way like a, to kind of uh, try to try to like handle this uh, whole shit that you call life. You know, it's a like a through pain you can find something that's a bit more like a, get some more clear clarity of that like a vision and stuff when there is always a bit of uncomfortable things then you kind of learn to respect those small good things like was it a, like a sunshine or some like a nice nice like a new records you hear or something you you just like when you have been experiencing something that's kind of uh, terms of uncomfortable then you kind of also know how it feels when it's actually you face something nice and I, I think that's the like a uh, the way how I at least personally try to try to like uh, see life and uh, things coming up on my way. Yeah, like I'm not like not like a, trying to 
trying to like get uh hang on on a like a world without like a feeling things like um uh, also those good things that's the, like a thing that i've been learning through my life like uh appreciating the small good things and also like uh, not giving too much value for that all that like a uh, unnecessary or not necessarily like a pain that comes with it yeah yeah um what what is your working out routine like these days uh i i do pretty much every day i do something i like to like i go run or i like to go to cycle i like to like i go to i do strength training like a four five times in a week yeah but it's like I, I haven't never done anything like on this actual bodybuilding way that hardly do so it is more of this like a actual strength strength training i'm more like i do exercise to like uh keep my head in one piece <laughs> and keep my like uh myself under like this uh condition that i'm i'm able to like uh do everyday tasks and stuff stuff like that but yeah it's a it's absolutely necessary for me personally i i i can't like uh work well in my like at uh, this uh cognitive and like at uh, this uh creative creative way if i don't do also something physical like exercise and stuff yeah i think people i think humans in general need this because yes. People always forget that the brain and the body are, you know, one and the same, whatever is in your mind, I call it the spirit, you know, but yeah. I, that's just an analogy in a non-religious way of saying that there's some sort of energy within me that can go up and down. And if I don't exercise, that energy gets drained out. Um, and that's the opposite of how people think about it. When they exercise, they think they get tired, but in fact, we both know well, the three of us know that when you work out, you actually get more energy and you exactly. get more creative energy, you get more focus and mm -hmm. you start to enjoy life a little bit more. You become less nihilistic. So, I mean, it's always that battle, right? Like you're always trying to, I, I think entropy is the law of the universe. So everything is always going towards chaos, but you're trying to put order back into place. And I think physicality is one way of getting back the order um and getting charged putting the battery back you know the charge back in the battery in your body i think it's it's very important and uh i i found out the hard way because i was very sedentary for many years and then at age 40 i found myself kind of sluggish and having physical problems and then my doctor was like you better start exercising because yeah. your physical health is failing and that's probably you know leading to your mental health issues as well so i think one in, it's it's basically one and the same and people don't, don't seem to realize this um and i it's it's interesting talking to musicians because um they realize this fact and they realize how this physicality of working out leads to more creative output so you see a lot of people lifting weights in the metal scene for this reason i think i yeah. you know i have to ask a traditional sodomizer from blasphemy or you know he's not in blasphemy mm -hmm. anymore but he, he's in witch's hammer he's yeah. a crazy bodybuilder and he he's also like a like a coach or something so I, yeah yeah i need to ask him you know why why he does what he does because i i'm pretty sure it's the same type of answer through this workout he gets more creative output from the music Mm -hmm. I'm pretty yeah. sure that's gonna be the answer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and for me, it's also like kind of um, it's also about fighting, fighting the the alienation of like a. I think the whole this um easy kind of easy modern technologized world we we have. It's kind of a. I feel it's it's kind of a thing that alienates like tends to alienate myself mm -hmm. from the the actual world you know i think that the getting the whole workout done is like as like remind me getting like unalienated about it 
for a little while and like getting more in touch of the reality. Yeah. The reality, what do you, what do you call it? But but it's uh, like I said before, it's uh, how I think the mu doing the whole music thing. I think it's all the same. I it, it, I think it, it, somehow the creative part has to do with that as well for me because I I usually um, have the drums, the percussive elements, and that kind of stuff as a as a as a starting point of composing and stuff. So it's kind of a, the whole pulsa pulsing and uh, this physical side of music is is really important for me as a create like creative artist as well so I, I i think that's how they're connected as well like it's it's not just things i do with my body but it's actually like me being in the world like actually mm -hmm. existing in a way yeah. it, it, be it the music or be it the workout workout is more more i think that's the more private thing of course there's a lot of private elements in the music as well but in the music i also find it more like a magical way of actually affecting the world like people like because there's some at least some um some uh, entities that will experience it and change a little bit somehow i don't know i i may maybe kind of a chaotic magic because i don't i don't have the control over how mm. it works in the world but still it's it's more like a this that kind of a yeah but they're they're both both the same kind of a same same thing it's it's like the output it's very different but in in my world in my whole existence i think they're pretty much the same thing in general but yeah Answering answer the, the, the later, later question, uh, the previous question about the workout routine is, is basically really, I've been like several years been doing like this kind of a two split sort of power building things, few, like few times a week. It's a, I, I usually aim to four, four workouts, so the whole body twice a week. But it's uh, when I'm busy with stuff, it's it can, can be like three times, two or three times a week. But it's usually like yeah, splitting the body into different like sets of uh, body parts or muscle groups, and then just concentrating on the power powerlifting uh, exercises, but more into the like a little bit towards the bodybuilding way. So not actually like a maximum power, but more like a power and some perhaps like muscle mass oriented ways and yeah it's but it's like i said it's i it's not like a it's not anything um too um ambitious it's more like just surviving <laughs> and getting having it in my life mm -hmm. it's more like that and i i found that's that's suited best for me that kind of a workout i like um they were like eight years ago something like that i i tried some like really uh ambitious uh, this kind of a uh, workout programs but it, I, I i guess they were more like um designed for some like a uh, um competition yeah 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 not not for the natural kind of a yeah. vegan diet yeah. sort of thing more like a <laughs> more like a <laughs> some enhanced things so i got like it was it was good for a year but after that i i i was like getting overly overly um uh over the over the over the line and getting sick all the time and i, I realized that it wasn't just i i would have quit all the other work other other jobs mm -hmm. i would have be, uh, would have had to be able to sleep 10 hours a night or something like that to right. keep on doing that and not getting my like body fucked up so i after uh, since that i've been more like uh yeah i just want to keep it going on i the last the last year 2023 was uh, was the worst i think the worst um year in 10 years 
for me because I uh, uh in the springtime I I um uh, I broke my wrist mm. and I was I, the whole healing process I wasn't able even even to do drums I <laughs> but I did some some recordings a couple of months after that but it was just like recovering from that several months and after that being a couple of times sick and all that stuff so it's kind of a yeah now now I, I'm not looking forward to anything but I hope I, I I will try to maintain the routine for this year to get back where I was before 2023 spring so <laughs> yeah yeah um I want to switch gears a little bit again um this is a question that I always always want to ask Finnish people because Finland is kind of a weird island in itself uh, in terms of culture and landscape, weather. And for whatever reason, um, you guys produce the largest number of underground metal bands, you know, by comparison to the overall population of about 5 million, I think you have the highest per capita band concentration of any country. And why, so my my question is, why? what do you think is the reason for this? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I always wonder that myself, like, uh, at least it has been that way. Uh, I I don't know. It's a. Uh, I just hope that it would be like a the same thing after like a next decay, like when it's the next decay or something. Because of course, uh, it's a uh, always. I have been at least seeing that develop like a progression on a, like um, when you go, for example, see watching some metal shows. Okay, there is still like a lot of like uh, this uh, young guys who do it like a they have their own bands and they they are excited about like uh doing things but in the like uh same same time it's uh noticeable how like uh how more, much like a less there is always like a places where for example young bands can get to like a play shows and uh how how like a uh, year after year there has been like this development that the uh, geek places has been closing down record stores has been starting to disappear people buy more and more like music online and uh it's uh, like uh, when you go to see metal shows there is uh, always like this certain old people's coming to see bands and uh, there is not that much those younger people's coming you know like uh Mm -hmm. to see shows mm -hmm. anymore but i i don't know it's a like a, maybe it's the whole situation that we still have this much metal bands in a, that countries the conditions here we have a, like this always almost like a half of the year we have like this almost like a whole day like a dark <laughs> dark yeah. like a nasty weather like a it's just like uh seems more natural to like uh kind of be in that like a bit darker kind of mindset and music and stuff like that. It just works some more natural way here than for example if you would live in the Bahamas or some bits or <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think you mentioned the isolation. I think uh yeah if you, if you think about for ex especially the underground music culture metal call metal or punk it's a, it's a, a, actually striking how most of that is done outside the bigger cities they're mm -hmm. originated for example i am originated from the small town next to the la perantani matter where all this you know lots of like black metal comes from i didn't know them when i was young but but lots of like these kind of uh, small areas scattered all the way, all the way, uh, all the around the Finnish map, and it's a. Uh, I've sometimes thought about it, and I think it might have, like Heidi said, like when it, when there's cold, there's nothing to do in the smaller towns. 
the teenagers go mm. to the rehearsal place and make some noise. Yeah. And it's uh, because of the, without any like proper scene, it's just like a bunch of people. You, you'd be glad, you at least in the past, you were glad to find like five people to, could act, who could actually play something. And then you start doing something and you, the there's no some scene to tell you what kind you are supposed to be doing right now but it's more like you you try you you make make it your own you make something and it it appeared that many times it had been something that no one else done before may they may have some influences but they've done maybe due to lack of talent or actual playing instruments or of just having like one or two tapes and not having the whole picture but ending up doing like something really original that no one has done like that before mm -hmm. and when you have those kind of a, and I think for example you were talking about uh, the tape trading and all that stuff the old days when people like when that kind of start, uh, stuff started to spread like like pre-internet like people like really in their own underground bubble but still like doing their like their own things very locally not mm -hmm. not belonging to any like like bigger bigger city scenes or showing up at the gigs but you just there's just like random kids driving to the like you know the youth houses and see like like this isolation and, and i in my in my when i'm imagining this i i still also imagine the the winter time you know, like <laughs> driving in the dark with some like back of some like stage stuff in your car and tr drinking a beer and arriving to the nowhere like place in in the middle of nowhere i think th the whole it's just like yeah i i'm not sure if it's a necessity necessity that that kind of thing happened but i think when it started to happen but i i, I don't think it it originates from the from the the whole 80s punk scene mm -hmm. in, in a way like having this really underground local local bunch of people all around and then then starting to get interested in more stuff. And it, that's also, I think, something that Finland has, the phenomena that has been going on in Finland that people aren't usually, at least uh, the people who've been lots um, like years in the, in the underground music, they aren't just death metal or a punk or something, but being like you said, like, being doing lots of different things and and having having connections to the different kinds of music scenes mm. that's because there's not like a big scene of like punk but there's a like a bunch of people who are interested in extreme music and they right. get interested in different things and so that is also how the connections are made you know people people know each other from very different backgrounds very different uh eras of life and they they got like a like picturing the 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 small town bar when when the different kinds of metal metal people or punk people had been drinking beer and like you know these are the 10 only 10 people in the whole city or town that listen to extreme extreme music mm -hmm. they might have different interests in music like like this punk or metal or whatever noise but they're still like connecting each other in a personal level and like somehow exchanging the the cultural exchange in the very small uh scene if you if you say so mm -hmm. i think that's also that makes it had been making it uh somehow characteristic the whole finnish underground music there's no but what about something more practical? Like, uh, I know that in like a country like Sweden, the government pays for the rehearsal space. Is there something like that in Finland as well? 
No, absolutely not. No. It's what like the... uh, I, I still remember like uh, when I was a uh, like a uh, teenager. We used to like go to rehearse with my like uh, friends. I had like a three friends with we just like uh, went to rehearse like uh, somewhere where we were able to get. And it was like a uh, usually like uh, in the winter time, for example, we drive by bus to rehearsal room, which you happen to be like at that time, uh, one of the like a youth house where we were able to get like a once a week to rehearse and. I was carrying like on a plastic bag my this uh, guitar combo to go to rehearse there. You know, like a snow and uh, rain and everything. We just went there and rehearsed there, but there wasn't any kind of support. And once we get to like a thrown out of our rehearsal room because we weren't like a, we were just some band playing some weird noise. We were trying to play some death metal or black metal or whatever it was, like some shit. But yeah, there there is not like it's not that much support that to play like a music. But uh, but I think that, that's a bit different. Like for Haiti being in, in a, like the slightly like larger towns than for example the small towns we used to have. I think the the having the one communal spot, you know, yeah. communal place that is not maybe I don't know where the money comes originally from, but it's like communal money. And so it's it's really cheap. They're not perhaps free. Sometimes they even can be free. I think we even had some free in Yolteno where I lived. But it was like a in that kind of way, there are like uh we for example, Yolteno, we have these older hippie guys who who started to work in the in the in the town for the town, having getting paid from the, for the town to having little studio spots and mm -hmm. recording some bands demos and stuff like that so i think there's a at the communal level there are some something like that going on uh, okay. usually so it's or, not it's not always like uh uh i guess federal level i guess in the us there's a concept of state and federal like at the top level of government um it's not a program like that where it's just nationwide. There are rehearsal spaces. It just depends on the town or city you're in. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think, yeah, it's most like that. But when we were from a really small town, you had the exact one place usually like okay. connected to the, the other communal services, like and youth houses yeah. and all that stuff. So it was mm -hmm. the place and you could have like a, at the gigs at the same time. Same or, very, very same place. Or and if you for example, if your friends, uh, like a parents, happen to have like a garage where yeah. you can go to set your own rehearsal place there, that's still like a pretty usual thing. Also, still in Finland, <laughs> like if you don't have any other place to go to rehearse, then you just build something where you can rehearse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think my the first bands I was like in fifth as a fifteen year old playing the progressive stuff was actually like at the basement of, of friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. Um, I guess we'll never get to the bottom of why there's so many bands, but I think we got a glimpse of, you know, some of the reasons, um, at least in the U S there aren't any rehearsal spaces that are paid for by the government. So mm -hmm. If somebody really wants to start a band, they have to pay for everything. They have to pay for the rehearsal space. They have to pay for recording, whatever the case. So I think it's a bit more DIY than um, in Nordic countries. It seems like in Sweden, there's a you know sy systematic way of rehearsing and recording. And it seems like it's much easier to do music in Sweden compared to the US and that probably explains why there's so many more Swedish metal bands than uh, American metal bands, um, or at least right now, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, there are lots of this kind of a Nordic welfare system where lots of, like, public funding of stuff going mm -hmm. on. I think it's, it may be, maybe some, like, a accidental to have it, like, on the music side and not for... Yeah. Not just sports or something like that, but it's. Uh, I think people t took the advantage whenever they they 
could have mm -hmm. in the past as well. So I yeah. Yeah, I, I'm usually like a person who doesn't like government funded programs like this, but when it comes to art, it seems like a good idea. Um yeah. because it keeps younger people active and I, culture is created, you know. Yeah. Um, and like Heidi was saying that going to the 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 gigs gigs and and not like not seeing any young people it's for example here in Helsinki it's really really hard to like kind of um, get a gig or into the gig as an audience member even if you're underage because most of the places are bars right where they have, they have the age limit because they serve alcohol and all that stuff so it was a um, it's a it's pretty much dependent on the places like that to have young people to go and experience live shows and nowadays for example there's a uh, just a uh, around the corner for where i live there's a this little place there's like a it's not just for music but also kinds of creative stuff and all that stuff but it's a uh, for youth youth mainly for youth and there's now they, there have been like a, several years of death metal kicks. And now when you go there, you can actually have a, a pit full of 16 year olds with all the back patches and all that stuff. That wasn't the case five years ago or 10 years ago when the when the average age was just rising. The same people going there for for a decade and no, not a single young person coming to join. And the, that was starting to look pretty awful that like feeling young like myself and and getting over 30 year and 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 mm -hmm. still realizing that I'm the yeah. younger mostly the youngest group of youngest people there but now when you there's this kind of a one place mm -hmm. yeah. it's not just yeah. the one place the the young people could get their gigs they can get to play they can get to see the bands and I was I was like amazed when I went there like a half a year ago after several years of there and and finding out there are like 16 year olds olds with catharsis back patches and all that stuff and like mm -hmm. like not even like cannibal corpse shirts like like just having a taste of death metal but actually like underground mm. underground patches and shirts and really young people like and weren't there any places like that i i think they never got into that i i, I don't I don't think the internet would would serve as well, like having TikToks or anything like that. It may be the one that introduced you as a as a kid, but you need to go to the gigs and and see the live bands to actually like get into the in the whole thing. I mm -hmm. think so. That's that's why they're so important. But that's yeah. also like a I I need to mention, but like a that's a, like a they both live nowadays like this. Uh, big city, big, not, not actual big city in the U.S., you know, spectrum in a Helsinki, which is the biggest mm -hmm. city in health, like a Finland. But like uh, also here, there is a, this uh, like a gig places. There is only like a couple of this place where actually young people can go and see the gigs because mostly the gigs are now arranged in the bars, which are like, a, we have an age limit for like a, when you can go to the bar and see the gigs and this kind of stuff. But that's also the reason why there has been this uh, groups of young people who has been trying to like uh, set up their own like uh, this uh, venues and this kind of stuff, or then this kind of thing to do in a like outside bigger cities that people are setting up gigs in a barns or like uh, someone's like uh, this uh, like a uh, old, old like a uh, household holds or something like that but i hope that kind of system will still like a uh, get like uh, some inspiration yeah and, yeah. and that is all only possible in the smaller towns it, yes. you, you don't you can't find any like barn or any any kind of that kind of free place in helsinki you have yeah. You have to be living in the in the countryside, and th and that's why, for example, I think, for example, in the in the eastern most eastern parts of Finland have 
has the the really ongoing death metal scene, for example, nowadays, because they have the lots of DIY places. They can just get mm -hmm. gigs here and there, not just the biggest bar, metal bar in the city, but actual like small, like wooden houses here and there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So so the thing is thing is kind of a happening again like where the where the smaller towns are like getting the fresh blood out of the uh, yeah. into, into the scene so i i'm like first time in in a in long time it it looks like actually there's some revitalizing going on <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah in terms of the of the age and all that stuff mm. yeah that's important and speaking of live gigs um Finland is one of the few countries in the in Europe where gigs can happen of all different types of music. It could be, you know, politically incorrect stuff playing with regular death metal and black metal bands, and people usually don't give a shit. Uh, while the rest of Europe cares a lot, and a lot of gigs get canceled or protested or whatever. Why do you think this is like why what makes Finnish people smart enough, in my opinion, to separate art from the artist and politics and treat it as just um just art for art's sake? Well, mm -hmm. I need to say that's a, like a good question. How long that kind of you know attitude is possible to have here? Because I have been following this like um this uh transition of like uh, having more and more like uh places which don't allow for example metal gigs to be there because mm -hmm. there is that different kind of political like uh, you know reasons why they think that if if someone for example has a death metal band or black metal band it it instantly means that there is going to be some like a uh, some kind of like you know hassle or this kind of stuff and uh i i don't know there you know it seems like in a more and more in a central europe and places like that it it has been starting to resemble more of that u.s like a system that there is a lot of like this attitude that if you play more some like a black or death metal you you can't come to play here and I have been facing this with my own bands, <laughs> also this kind of things mm. in the past. But like, um, it's uh, it's a good question that how long we will have this kind of you know like thing that people from the punk punk scene hang out with the metal metal scene and this kind of stuff mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a bit like a, you know this we call in Finland like a tulen arka. How you hardly translate that <laughs> term in a, like a yeah. English. Yes, I'm, yeah, somehow sensitive, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely a phenomenon that was exported out of the US and sort of like a virus, almost <laughs> like a like a like a religion in a way, this like activist yes. mentality where they have to just go attack. It's like a antibody attacking uh what it perceives as the enemy at all costs yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah i think it's it's a part of the 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 change in the activism like uh, in general i i for example like i said i i i grew up in punk and i i also have been like a, in a lots of in environmental activism myself so it's kind of a I'm interested in the whole like the activism, political activism, and how it works mm -hmm. in, a, in a theoretical way as well. And I think it's uh, something to do with the with the internet era sort of uh, easiness of like kind of a uh, get getting the idea of that you actually achieved something when you make some noise. It's easy to send some emails or like uh, or make a a post on some social media platform and watch people go mad and mm -hmm. perhaps then find out that the, the gig was cancelled. So it's kind of a, it's a power trip when you get like the idea that you actually achieved something important, you made, made a difference. So it's kind of a, 
it's a this light activism that's been going on the on worldwide yeah since the internet bursting out i think that has something to do with that uh and it's um i think why people uh, in finland haven't been so fast with the change has something to do like like we were talking about uh the underground scenes being mixed in the past i think because people know each other from different scenes they know each other from different backgrounds mm -hmm. uh, it's it's been usually like if you're gonna cancel one gig, you you know the person they are talking about and you can like what's the problem like like it, it, people can can actually like see and talk and all that stuff but i think nowadays when the there's some little bit more shift towards the isolated scenes like mm -hmm. isolated activist punk scene isolated mm -hmm. even even some of these you like activists of another kind scenes mm -hmm. that are actually like trying to keep their um group together tighten them together and that's now it's it's been going a little bit towards that that kind of way there are some for example um more perhaps more punk oriented places that may have mm -hmm. this stricter policy because of that that they they've been kind of a having some metal kicks and then then finding out via some email chat or something like that these problematic connections and then thought that maybe this is not the step we're not go we're gonna take and isolating themselves from the the mm -hmm. like certain types of underground culture like as a safe move so there have been some places that that have been getting stricter with their policies but but yeah, not not like the the cancellations, not not like cancellations like like you have. Mostly when when there's some gigs cancelled, it's usually just moved somewhere mm -hmm. in the private yeah. and, and something like that. So not actual yeah, private private venue or happening in some private venue or yeah. something. But for example, that place which you mentioned that uh, which you were amazed how was there was like a lot of these very young people's, you know. Uh, that's one of those places which have a very strict rules about the like a bands which kind of bands can play there, mm -hmm. and that's like mm -hmm. a, that leaves out for certain kind of you know kind of uh, music because it's a it's a kind of organized by this uh, group of this uh, punk people I think mostly yeah yeah that's, that's yeah. unfortunate I. I do think that the internet um, tends to divide people into echo chambers. Mm -hmm. It can be used to connect people as well, but usually yeah. people self-isolate into echo chambers. Yeah. And then they look for social credit increases by making a fuss about something. I, I feel like it's very similar to the... Um, the religious fervor and the cancellation culture of yeah. the late eighties when, and I don't know if you remember, but in, in the U S people like Tipper Gore was coming after like a uh, gangster rap and some Slayer Slayer uh, lyrics and just nonsense like that. And also like the satanic panic of the early eighties yeah. is very reminiscent of this because exactly. They were, they didn't have the internet back then, so it didn't spread as much, but it felt very similar. Because I lived through at least the Tipper Gore stuff. I was young, but I still saw it. And it's it's very much a parallel of what's going on right now. Except, you know, in the past it was like religious right, but now it's like religious left. And the new religion is this weird... Uh, I don't know, menu items of gender ideology and environmental ideologies and some other stuff. It's all kind of mixed up. Yeah. Um, and if you don't agree, like let's say you agree on the environmental stuff, but maybe you don't agree on some other stuff, you're a heretic. Yeah. And if you have, if you hold an opinion that goes against any of them, you're a heretic. And yeah, they'll yeah. come after you for any anything off the menu item. Yeah, yeah, it's, it has something to do with the the puritanist way right. of thinking. Exactly, like, it's definitely like a puritanist type of and, uh, and hygiene, hygiene, 
of like yeah. like isolating your your like everything. And it's I I, I and for example, I I think it's if someone wants to do that, okay. I don't like if someone wants to like feels like this isn't good for me or I don't want to have anything to do with the, these kind of people or this kind of scene. So be it. It's, it's like like yeah. if they feel if they feel, feel well enough, that's okay. But for example, I I think uh, I think we're coming to the 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 original idea of not having too easy life i think we also need some kind of a i need for for example i need different kinds of perspectives to oh, yeah. even like like find my where i actually stand mm -hmm. like i don't i don't want to isolate those kind of things that like they didn't exist because that would just make make my own visions and my own values lazy and right. like empty hollow i i i I kind of uh, I feel like that. Of course, not anyone has to like collaborate with everyone. People right. can have lines, and that's that's their right to do. They can have the lines that we don't want you to play here. But it's like uh, the whole idea of like this kind of uh, uh, being a police, like like and finding finding the place things to make fuss about. That's the, something that reminds me of the, of you know these religious, religious uh, groups where you, where you when you when you are after someone's impurity, they're not right. pure about this. They're they're not like, you know what I mean. So it's right. it's kind of that, that's the kind of the thing that even though like I said, I I I have an, lots of background in activism myself. I, I I kind of uh, appreciate the, the idea of people are working towards the things they value, but mm -hmm. it's like I think this is something that I don't I, I don't like find neither effective or actually on the point even because it's I more see. like wa wasting your energy uh, like being against something than actually being towards and pro something you value it's more like wasting mm. your energy into like nonsense yes, like i think we both know that it's much easier to destroy than to create yeah, yeah. because the entire existence is always going towards entropy and we're coming back to this theme again the harder thing is actually creating bridges and not dehumanizing somebody who disagrees with you if you disagree with somebody the harder thing is actually to have a conversation and build, you know, maybe yeah. you'll learn something, right? Maybe you'll yeah, learn something I'm... and they might even change their minds or you might change your mind. But the easier thing is to just destroy, destroy, yeah. destroy, because entropy is already going in that direction. And then maybe you can pick up some social, social credit score along the way for the internet crowd who doesn't give a shit about you anyway. So I, I think all of society is kind of go, going in that direction of echo chamber and isolation because of technology. And we're coming back again to this, this weird dichotomy of technology and humanity. The more we get closer to the technological side, the worse humanity becomes. In yeah. Life. And, and when, when, when we're talking about art, I think that I don't see it as a as a as a um, point of art or meaning of art, but I think art is also the place where where you actually can have conflicted ideas. You can you can meet conflicted ideals, and you can still find some like things and meanings to to get into. Like you you might even find a piece of art that you you know you know from the from the very facts of the artist or you know from the facts of the lyrics or or the imagery mm -hmm. that you don't agree with this person or this kind of a intention behind this music at all but you right. can still but but it can still be something like more than that yeah yeah and you can it's still feel right for you. Right. It's it's art for you. yeah when 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 we when we kind of 
start treating art like something that has to have this fixed value system or fixed any anything, be it or the same, be it your own value system or the other ones. It kind of loses the art, the whole thing about art. It got becomes something, something else, and that's that's what I'm. If I'm against something, that's what I am against. Yeah, I, I, got, I think you yeah. touch on something very important, and we can give like concrete examples of a lot of music where there is obvious conflict of interest. Like if I listen to Motorhead Jailbait, you know, that's one that I yeah. always bring up as an example because I got a 15 year old daughter. <laughs> and so Jailbait is basically pedophilia that he's talking about, you know. I mean, 70s rockers are always talking about that. UFO had a song called Rock Bottom, which is, you know, about pedophilia too, like 20-year-olds going after high school girls. Yeah. <laughs> and this was like part of the course for many years. I don't know if, I don't, I don't think many bands are exploring those ideas now, but, you know, she was only 17 by Warrant. I think that was Warrant, right? Yeah. I mean, that was mainstream radio material for many years. Same with mm -hmm. like Cherry Pie. I forgot who that band was, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but there's there's so yeah. much music like that where, you know, it's obviously really like Warrant really isn't all that great, but Motorhead is great in my opinion. I can listen to Motorhead all day, but I don't yeah. have to agree about, you know, whatever Lemmy is singing about. I'm not going to sniff loop, but I will listen to Ace of Spades. Yeah. Know? Exactly. And I, I think that's the one thing that, you know, people nowadays, they just like a, completely forget that that kind of, you know, attitude is possible to have. Because also that what we were thinking, what we were talking, what Harley was just explaining about that, like uh, how you can have a, like a different opinion with someone and still like uh, have something you agree deeply and you like uh, respect them. That's uh, like uh, something that many people don't just they just can't understand that kind of you know coexistence and the way also how how like uh if you don't like someone's like uh way to be or if you don't like their way to like uh, do music or like a uh, experience mu like a uh, uh show music like a uh, arrange shows or something but you can still like uh, just let them be like that's not like a problem if if they do that their own stuff in some of their own place and you do your own stuff in your own place and then there is just like a both can exist but like there doesn't need to be some like a fight or conflict between them that seems to be like a very very difficult for people to understand like that kind of coexistence is possible actually yeah <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the other thing that I noticed is there's a weird um, ranking of uh, ethics. So, you know, in my in my mind, number one is probably like rape and murder, you know? Yeah. Number one, rape and murder. That's probably the worst thing you can do. But it's come to the point where rape and murder is kind of deranked and like something like racism is number one in society. Yeah, so, yeah. If you're a racist, that's like much worse than if you're a murderer or a rapist. I mean, those people can actually come back to life and have a normal conversation. They can, they can like, they can have places uh, or status in society. Whereas if you're deemed a racist, you can never come back. Exactly. You know? Which is very interesting because racism is a state that you can easily change if you want. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're a murderer or a rapist, you can't come back from that. You've done the deed, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's With like, it's, it's, I don't understand this, uh, this ranking in society now. I, and that's not, there's like other stuff up there too that we won't go into, but I think we can guess what they are. It's just that the whole ethical ranking just doesn't make much sense in society anymore. And maybe that's because of postmodern thinking or some some other problem that society has right now. It just seems very religious because there's no logic involved in how things are perceived. Yeah, I agree. Like uh, I agree very much what you just said, and uh, that's uh, like uh, the good 
just like this comparison was exactly that religion. You know, they most of this like a groups or peoples who want to rage about this and that thing and always being like accusing someone about something that's wrong in their opinion. It's a, the problem is they act like they would be some very strict religious group who would like to just erase everything that that doesn't agree hundred percent with them with everything that they like uh, all of their opinions. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. It's a very dualistic way of seeing things that yes. you know, just like. The, the right who are completely right and who are completely wrong and know like nothing about the the whole contradictional nothing uh, between yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Because, and like like kind of a missing the point that we're like no one's no one's pure or like saint right. anyway but yeah. there's like a the, the whole idea of this dualistic system is that, that's that's the most religious thing in this all that you can actually find like the, those who are who are going to heaven and those who are going to hell and you can just tell them by nothing. Yeah. yeah, and hell is basically getting kicked out of society, losing your bank account, you know, yeah. <laughs> payment processing, your online accounts are deleted. That's the yeah. hell that they they put people in. You know, yeah. that's your time out from society that you can't never come back from. There is no redemption. Mm-hmm. You're you're a heretic, and that's how we're gonna perceive you forever. Yeah. It's it's very religious and it's unfortunate. Hopefully, younger people can turn this around because they can mm-hmm. reject that religion just like we rejected Christianity. I feel like Christianity has no fang whatsoever. So it's yeah. it's not really something that makes sense to attack at this point it doesn't at least in the u.s it's so neutralized and neutered that it's like what's the point in fighting christianity they're not doing anything you know (laughs) like i would rather fight the religion of the secular religion of whatever this is that's happening in society i think that's a lot more dangerous to art and culture than christianity is right now yeah i i think the the what's what's left on the christianity on the on the negative or harmful side is is those con- concepts that are like brought into secular uh, like uh, context or right. this like this idea of sinning like the sin it just has a different meaning but it's the, the same kind of thing like it works the same way and so it's a yeah i think like like the whole dualistic system is something that that would need need something to like i don't say i like going perhaps against in all levels but some some somehow change mm-hmm. but i yeah, i'm not my problem is that i'm not too optimistic about anything the, the least about the humanity because i don't i'm not an anthropophiliac mm. like as a i, I I I love many pe- many people as a per- as persons. I I have lots of ap- appreciation about the uh, several parts of human culture, but I don't like uh, I don't have any like uh, savior savior fantasies about the humanity that it's going on gonna change into better as a whole. So it's a uh, so I think the only only ways to actually like get something better is to like not perhaps on the on the very grassroots level but still like locally and like like standing like true to yourself and mm-hmm. like within your own own value system and all this stuff but not, not, not like yeah i don't i don't unfortunately i don't i don't see there's a, a big change coming up it's it's been a we are like it's is it already eight billion, something like that? Yeah, yeah, and and like <laughs> globalization the way it is, it seems like yeah. this sort of secular religion is spreading its tentacles all over the world. You yeah. know, I mean, Europe is taken over by it. Um, I think it's slowly creeping into Asia, but like countries like Japan are very isolated because it's an island and also culturally strong. 
so it hasn't gotten taken over yet, but I I watch a lot of Japanese television on Netflix, and Netflix is producing some of these agenda-driven TV shows in Japanese. So tentacles are already spreading. Um, yeah, you know, because the, every, yeah, everything is connected by the market anyway. Yeah, so exactly, the, the free market and globalization and internet is spreading this the tentacles all over the place. Um, I'm, you know, I, I have this opinion, <laughs> you guys might disagree, but humans have this tendency to look for religion. It doesn't matter if the religion is something like the secular religion that's coming up now or old religion like Christianity. Um, I feel like most of the human population is made up of drone like people who just kind of go through life, they don't create, they just live through life, they get diabetes, they get fat and they die or something. This this is this is my observation of humanity. I'm not that optimistic either, but here's my optimistic take on it. I wish that they would rediscover some sort of old religion. I don't even care if it's Christianity or something. I hope it's mm -hmm. not Islam because Islam has its other issues. But mm -hmm. I wouldn't I wouldn't be um, so much against Europeans finding Christianity for the most part, because that would keep people occupied and creative people can go back to just creating and not getting bothered by these normies who have problems with creation on the darker side of things. So religion is basically like a scaffolding for people who need scaffolding. Most people, I think, in the metal scene don't need this scaffolding or infrastructure or operating system or however you want to call it for how to go through life. And like we discussed before, we introduce other things like creation of music uh, or you know physical activity or whatever the case. We find meaning in these things, and that's basically our religion. I think normal people who just go to work get fat and they die they find that they need a religion and i feel like most of society most of humanity would benefit from having some sort of a structured religion in their life that's time tested so yeah this yeah, might I, sound I, like a very weird thing to say as somebody who works you know in the black metal scene mm -hmm. but i wish the Western society would actually go back to more Christian values so that they can leave us alone again. Yeah. I would I, maybe say that, uh, like, um, that way that um, humans are kind of, uh, I, I see humans as the one species among all others, and uh, humans are kind of a, that kind of animals that naturally it's good for them to have some kind of, you know, the structure in their life and uh, some way like a routines and something like uh, that gives their some kind of meaning or like uh, keeps them like uh, healthy and, uh, you know, happy and this kind of stuff. But like, uh, it should be something else than religion in my own personal opinion, because uh, it's always like a, for example, I don't need any commandments for any kind of leaders or religious like a gods or masters or this kind of stuff. It's not for me. But like uh, like we just discussed, we have other things in our life. Like uh, we can do like a exercise. We have a work and these kind of things. And uh, I don't know. It's just like uh, what everyone just feels to be like a right for them. But it's just uh, I have been also noticing like how this uh, whole religion thing has been starting to take more and more like uh, different kind of uh, attributes in our society and people are just dri drifting more far of it. But what comes, you know, next, that's the thing. Like they don't have anything anymore. It's just like this... Uh, system is kind of just floating in some emptiness which is filled by this uh all kind of commercial and this kind of stuff what you were saying Harry? yeah I, I was thinking about the whole religion thing i i wouldn't mind 
if humanity or different cultures turned into the into the religious systems that have have the like how could I say the right place for humanity? But I think the 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 biggest problem for me be it uh, this uh, monotheistic uh, religions like Christianity or other others or uh, or these uh, secular versions the secular humanism and all this stuff the, the problem is that they they value uh human life in all its forms above everything else and that's yeah. the, I think that's the, the the main problem of everything so yeah I, I think I, I i i agree that people would need the the majority of humanity would need some sort of uh, idea of uh appreciating and valuing other than just this random really basic commercialist ways of life mm -hmm. be it be it a religious life be it a, a natural asceticism or whatever mm -hmm. but it's just like the the problem is that like for my my perspective is that it's a very um ecocentric i idea of things so so the the main problem is that the whole these monotheistic systems these anti-dualistic systems they have all these these all these bad, like harmful things built together as a one one thing that where there's this humanity that is appreciated and cherished in every single form be it a, be it the the lowest lowest form and the the most polluting form or than than any other forms of life and that's we should like have the system if we had some systems i'm not the system believer i'm pretty much <laughs> against that like in my personal life but uh, the idea of having some systems would be would require some like sense in that like finding values and seeing values other also in other forms of life than just a human life because that's it we have in as humans we have lots of cultural things we have diversity that's that that is actually like that gives some extra to the world as a as a as a, as a globe but most of that is just pollution and something like that shouldn't be there in the first place so that's that's the, my my thing that be it a religious in a mystical way or secular system natural science natural science oriented way just we should have to sh swift shift this whole thing backwards mm -hmm. find like find our own unimportance instead of this narcissistic way of seeing everything yeah, i think we're on the same wavelength i just see it as a practical measure since Christianity's already existed in Europe, just put that over there and uh, let them deal with Christianity, leave us alone type of mentality. Because I, I, I don't have much hope for majority of society at large. Because a lot of people are just unthinking, eating machines that eat and shit, and they exist, and then they die of some sort of a disease, um, and that makes up the large majority of the population unfortunately yeah but i i think that the problem is that the, the in in europe the christianity the the where we are at now with this uh with this uh growth mm -hmm. the economic growth and everything that is actually just a like natural evolutionary step from the this christian like lutheran way of like mm -hmm. appreciating like lutheran like literally teach you had you, you work hard like to serve god right. work hard for, like earn money and like not not for you but but to make things happen so everything is just built on the same practical system so i i think that the train's already gone <laughs> like we yeah, see we, we, we had we perhaps we had this mystic mystic uh uh phase this time that there were like some 
some like um, perhaps uh, seeds for something greater in Christianity as well, like in, like I, like in many other belief systems as well. But I think we've seen how where it goes. So it's a this, we're just living another another level yeah. of that right now. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, re religion is dead, you know, that was already called by Nietzsche a long time ago, I, I think it's pretty much gone. Um, religion only plays a big part in the Middle East, and some other countries like maybe India. Uh, but religion does not play a role in most of the industrialized countries in Europe, US, Japan, China. Um, I don't know about Russia, but it's probably that train has already left the station and that vacuum is now getting filled with toxic waste of recent creations that are not time tested. And, and I feel like, yeah, I, I don't have much hope, but I'm hoping that young kids realize that this secular religion is bullshit as well. And they do the punk rock thing of rejecting that and then coming back to art for art's sake. And you know they stop they stop doing this bullshit. Um, yeah, that's that's my hopeful thinking. <laughs> yeah, I I think we we're, we're gonna see lots of different, uh, different um, um, outcomes for that. We're gonna we're gonna see the the counter cultures and we're gonna see everything. So it's it's like you like like we've been talking about the whole ways of internet. It's it brings people together, but it also it also makes them further away from from each other. These groups of people. So mm. we're gonna see all the all the all the shades in the near future. And but but it will be interesting to see if there remains like a the story, you know, the one story to mm. to overcome the others, and which one would be would that be if it if it's just like a regret of having this moment of moment of insanity or would it be some some sort of getting deeper into the into the abyss or something i don't know that's interesting yeah um so we kind of went on a tangent about something very deep and interesting but i want to end this podcast this conversation with something lighter so Finland is not exactly known for the best food, um, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, so I want to ask you, what is the best Finnish food? So Heidi, you want to go first? Tell me what the best Finnish food is. Uh, I like mammy. What is that? You don't know what's that. No, I don't, I don't know. The, you probably don't want to know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Probably that thing that's the mind center point, you know, like um, in all this, like uh, when you when you have been told that Finnish food is horrible, you know, it's uh, like this uh, traditionally Eastern time eaten like this thing that looks exactly like uh, shit, but it's actually it's very good. <laughs> I like it, and it's sweet for the springtime. Where very well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like, what is it made out of? Yeah. <laughs> it's, made oh, of it's rye rye flour. It's rye like flour. A, yeah. Yeah. It's a kind of a yeah. It's dark rye based dessert sort oh, of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But it's like a porridge, but it's that looks like it's, bad. Yeah. it's delicious. Yeah, I'll have to try that next time I'm in Finland. You, you should. Yeah. All right. Oh, All right. Uh, I was thinking, um, I, I've always, I'm, I, I've always loved all the food I eat. Kind of, I'm, I know. <laughs> the only, I like, I only limit my my diet by the by the ethical choices. So, so I, I used to love this kind of a traditional, you know, meat based stuff when I was a kid. But and now I now I enjoy them. Mm -hmm. all the sausages as a vegan versions nowadays mm -hmm. so it's a, but uh, but I, if i had to say some like um that is actually like by nature uh uh go something that i'd eat 
would be all the mushroom dishes, mm -hmm. you know, mushroom sauces and all that stuff. Because especially in the eastern parts, eastern parts of Finland, uh, there's lots of I, I'm I'm a, have this Karelian background, and there's lots of in the Karelian um, culture. There's lots of uh, uh, this mushroom picking and mushroom eating and like something similar to the some parts of the of the Russian air, uh, part, but the, the Karelian culture is a different one. So uh, if I had to uh, like pick some, like I feel like it's a local, somehow local things would be all those mushroom, different mm. mushroom dishes. Yeah, that's interesting because if you if you go to the farmer's market here, you can mm. buy some of the mushrooms, but they're super expensive. But yeah. you can just go into the woods and pick them yourself, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, we have we have this uh, every month, every person's rights to go to yeah. pick any berry, any, any mushrooms in any any places. There's no even if you own the land, no one can mm -hmm. you not to not to pick those. So it's a uh, yeah. I think that's that's the best one of the best things in Finnish uh, uh, idea of nature and this culture nat culture cultural things considering nature. We have lots of like harmful negative things as well like within our relationship with uh with animal farming and all that stuff but i think that that the idea that there's no like private land that you can't go and walk and pick those berries and mushrooms i think that's the most yeah great one of the greatest things in finnish yeah. like, culture Absolutely, yeah. because it also like a, you know gives a change for people to like go and experience the nature and experience the woods and stuff like that. It encourages for that kind of activities. Yeah, yeah. There's probably an entire podcast around just fin Finland nature, paganism, and music. Yeah, we can probably have another two hour conversation about that by itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll save that for next time, I suppose. Um, yeah. So I, I want to end the, this long and interesting conversation by just asking you to to um, name one one band that we should be paying attention to. Some some band that we haven't heard yet. Um, Finnish band would be nice, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, how do I start? I like. Hmm, I don't have any deep cuts in my mind so i i'm being the lazy one now so i'm i'm referring myself on the earlier so I, i'm gonna give you the links to the 90s hardcore punk classics from finland so okay. those are not nothing new though those, those bands hasn't existed in more than a two decades so it's nothing new happening on but i i think those are the most outside finland people just don't know and they are really really great so yeah i don't have any yeah i'll share that in the comments or not comments but the description section yeah yeah mm. if you think like um i would maybe say like uh can it be old band or should it be some newer one yeah, it could be old but try to pick an obscure one that you know normal people wouldn't wouldn't even know about Okay, I have a lot of those in mind, <laughs> but, but like, uh, I would maybe say like uh, from uh, from Greece, I like uh, recommend to check Tati. That's a great band. Or Lemegeton. Those yeah. are one of my like a uh, couple of yeah. my favorite ones from there. Yeah. Yeah. Those I, are all I, bands. I yeah. try reissuing Lemegeton, but uh, I can't. I can't reach the guy. So, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe those are uh, Thomas, my like. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll ask Thomas from Dreadful Relic or something. I he said yeah. he might know where the guy is, but he, he's That'd not exactly in the scene anymore. Apparently. Yeah, yeah, I had that kind of impression. Yeah. But yeah. Well, those are my input now. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Kitos, to both of you for you know this long and interesting conversation. I'm sure people really enjoy it. So yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great Sunday. We'll talk. Thank again. you.
Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have sauna in an hour or so. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Right. Good night. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.